your body. Yes. Huh? That's what a posture of yes looks like. When you raise both hands in the presence of God. And it doesn't always mean that your yes is going to be easy. Huh? God tests us many times to see if our yes will be yes even in times of difficulty. Because I believe if it was easy, everybody would have the same posture, right? But it's not always going to be easy. But it doesn't change the fact that our purpose requires us to remain in a posture of yes. Somebody next to you, you may not even know, is counting on your posture of yes. Because they lost all hope. just look over at you and they can see a posture of yes, they will be reminded of the God of their salvation and many of the things that he's done for them in their lives. And they'll find themselves with their hands down by their side. They'll find themselves raising back up into a posture of yes. And all the congregation of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin. After their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that ye may drink we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river. Take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee, there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah, because the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Raphidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, choose, unto, choose us out, men, and go out. Fight the Amalek. T tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the mountain. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon, and Mo Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek 
and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and God, Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. For he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. May the Lord add a blessing to reading of his word. You may be seated. Today I want to speak to you on a subject. It's our winning season. Look at two people, one on your right and maybe one on your left, and tell them, get in position. Yes. Hallelujah. It's our winning season. Tell them, get in position. Uh, can I be transparent with you this morning? When, whenever God uh, gives me a message, typically he gives me the end of the message, and then I have to work my way back to the beginning. It's always um, a bit of a challenge because to work backwards, I always think to myself, any good story, a movie, or a good message should have a captivating beginning, a meaty middle, and a blockbuster ending. Sometimes in a movie, they'll show you the ending, and then they'll rewind all of the way back and start from the beginning to show you the series of events that got you there to the end. Well, with a message, it's not always as easy because I feel like if I give you the blockbuster ending, it's kind of hard to build you back up to get you there. And so I also think that it's kind of like when you make a new purchase and you pull out the instructions and you put them, uh, you want to put it together and they show you a picture of what the final product is going to look like. But then you have a page of instructions and they give you about 20 steps. And there's a whole lot of screws and bolts and washers and all of it has to be strategically and intentionally put together in order to get to the results of the picture that you see. But if you're anything like me, you dump all the parts out, you open out the instructions, and then you t attempt to put it together without reading one single step. Hallelujah, am I the only, about the only person here that does that? Hallelujah, where's my amen come, corner? Come on, somebody. And it never fails, I mean never, that the manufacturer apparently always puts too many screws in there. Because I always end up with a whole bunch more than I started with. And somebody gonna catch that on the way going home. Hallelujah, I don't think it's the manufacturer's fault. Amen, somebody. And so the moment of transparency is that every single time that I preach, as I am challenged to work backwards, I start to ask myself, am I purposed to preach? Is God sure that he called me? Am I truly cut out for this? And then somewhere between the anxiety, the desire to go AWOL, the fear, and everything else in between, I realized that I have forgotten to remember, as Minister Brittany told us last Sunday, God's got this. And in her words, he already done did it. Hallelujah, look, I quote her, he already done did it. And so then I moved out of the way and in a very God-like fashion, the portals began to open up. I have conversations with people many times as I'm preparing and even on yesterday, um, sometimes I'll go over some of my messages with my husband and he had to leave and he said, uh, when I come back, you know, we're gonna chat. And I was like, there's nothing there. And, and so it's crazy because two weeks ago, probably three weeks ago, God had given me this message, this message, and it preached so good. And so he'll minister to me and he'll give me jewels and I'll be thinking it. But when I sit down to prepare the message, it's like nothing happens. 
And that's my transparency moment. This happens every single time I preach. I go through this whole scenario every single time I preach. And so when you see me standing here, it's not that I don't have anxiety. Some people say you don't seem like you're nervous. Sometimes I'm shaking in my boots. Because sometimes I'm waiting for God to pull it all together. And to remind me that I am exactly where I should be. That I'm purposed to be in this place. But you think by now that I'd go straight to the portals opening up. But I think that'd be too much like right. And so I always seem to take the long road around. I lay the instructions out only to realize I've not used them and I have too many loose ends. Anybody else deal with that in their life? With any situations in their lives? Come on, somebody. How you can we be transparent in this place? And so this passage of scripture that I read into your hearing clearly shows us the children of Israel winning the battle that came upon them out of nowhere for no reason at all. Here they are smack dab in the middle of their exodus to the promised land. And now this, a battle has ensued. And all they wanted was some water. I know somebody in the camp had to be thinking, all oh, my life, I had to fight. I had to fight in Egypt. I had to fight to leave Egypt. I got to fight on my way to the promised land. I got to fight for some water. My Lord, all my life, I had to fight. Anybody else? Huh? Huh? Anybody else feel like the enemy is always saying, Duke's up. Huh? Right in front of you, ready to ensue a fight. It doesn't matter how hard you strive, how hard you decide you're going to be where God has purposed you to be. The enemy is standing right there every chance he can get to tell you, Duke's up. If you want this, you're going to fight for it. Hallelujah. You see in chapter 16, God had sent quail and manna. And we know that manna translates into bread. Because prior to that, they had been complaining about being hungry. And so God fed them for seven days straight. And so naturally, I get it, they would be thirsty. Huh? Have anybody tried to eat a bunch of bread with no water? That thing choke you. Get stuck, as I would say, right there in your throat. Not your throat, your throat right there. It won't move one way or the other. So I get it. They needed some water to get that thing to go on down. Hallelujah. It makes natural sense. But tell somebody, it was the complaining for me. Huh? You ever met anybody that really didn't deserve half of the stuff they had? And God had continued to bless them with more, and yet they still found a reason to complain. Can I get anybody else to just, because I'm going to raise my hand. I'm going to start it out. Listen, half the stuff we don't deserve, but yet we still find a reason to complain. And so here the children of Israel were finding another reason to complain because this wasn't their second complaint. There was a series of them that Moses had to deal with as he was bringing them out of their Egypt into the land that God had promised them. And here they were in the desert, rough of them, and they had the audacity not only to complain about water, but they said to Moses they weren't even sure if God was still with them. And so can I quickly take you through the whole biblical text in Exodus up until this point? So that means chapters 1 through 16, huh? Don't make me scare you. It's going to be real quick. I promise you. So let's start in chapter 1. 
Chapter 1 of Exodus, here is where the Jewish people were enslaved. They had begun to cry out to God in the midst of their oppression. And so we're going to fast forward to chapter 3. See, I told you it was going to be quick. And at this point, this is where God appears to Moses and says, I am has sent you. That's what Moses was supposed to tell the Israelites. The fact that I am has sent you was going to be their affirmation that God was, is, and would always be present. In chapter 5, Moses goes to Pharaoh and demands that Pharaoh let God people go. Fast forward through all of the plagues from chapters 5 through chapter 12. Right through the Passover in chapter 12, from the cha uh, Passover happens right from the beginning somewhere through the midway of chapter 12. And then the 10th plague happens at the end of chapter 12, somewhere between the verses of 29 and 30. But if that wasn't enough to be reminded that God is, I am, and was with them, here they were in chapter 14 where God led them through the Red Sea. Huh? Yeah, I said through. I didn't say around. He led them through the Red Sea. Huh? In chapter 15, maybe the water was bitter because he had already given them water. Moses had to throw a stick in and make the water sweet enough that they would not be complaining to drink so he had already given them water. They knew he could do it. He sent them food on the back side of that. But here they are again complaining. Tell somebody just complaining for no reason at all. Mm. And now you see why I say they had the audacity to ask if God had been with them. Here's one more trivial thing. I'm going to rewind back to chapter 13. Verses, and this is chapter 13, Exodus. You can read it at your own leisure later, but chapter 13, verses 17 through 18 says, When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not leave them on the road through the Philistine country. Though that was shorter, for God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. What I need for you to see here is many times God is working on our behalf and we don't have the first clue of what he's doing. How he's protecting us on a daily basis, day in and day out. Hmm? From dangers, they say, seen and what? Unseen. Y'all gonna help me preach this thing? Listen, we should never even think about fixing our mouths to question the hand of God and the presence of God at any time in our life. So God said, okay, you want to question my presence? I'll prove to you that I'm present. So God lifted his hands of covering, and right like I said, out of nowhere, the Amicalites moved in. See, learn from their mistakes. They, because of their contentious spirit, made God have to prove himself to them. Hmm? Somebody gonna catch that in their spirit. Because of their contentious spirit, God had to prove themselves to them. He was working before. He wasn't necessarily proving to them that he was working, but he was working. He knew first the first time to lead them around because he knew that they weren't gonna be able to handle it, right? This time, he was working it out. But because you want to question me, 
and you want to question my authority and you want to question my hand on what I'm doing to move you to a promised land that you don't even deserve, I'm going to show you who got the power. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. And just like that, hallelujah, God did not stay his hand anymore like he had done in chapter 13. Hallelujah. He could have stayed his hands and the Amalekites would have retreated, but God said not so. Your contentious spirit has called you to this place. My Lord God, here is where the blockbuster ending begins. Even with their complaining and contentious behavior, God still, huh? Somebody say still. God still created an opportunity for them to win the battle. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. I ought to feel some praise in here. Hallelujah. God winning any battles in anybody's life. Hallelujah. Listen, you ever met anybody that ever complained about everything but has no answers to solve the problem? Many years ago, before Pastor Witherspoon started preaching in this place, there were some things that he was dealing with, and we all had a bunch of answers, or not answers, we had a bunch of voices on the things that he was dealing with. And he said to us clearly, if you are not a part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Huh? Some people complain about everything, don't have no solutions to help move to the answer. Huh? Come on, somebody. And that's where the children of Israel were in their life. They were complaining about everything. But here Moses was leading them at the uh, call of I am to where they needed to be. And all they could do was complain. Majora Carter, she's an uh, African-American urban revitalization strategist. I know that's a lot. And a public radio host from South Bronx area of New York City. And she said it this way. If we are going to be a part of the solution, we have got to engage the problems. And so problems are defined as glitches and difficulties and complications and snags in the road. And it may not seem like some of us will have some of the same issues that the children of Israel were faced with on their exodus to the promised land. But I can guarantee you that every one of us have got our own promised land. Huh? Every one of us have got our own promised land. And every one of us at some point in our life are going to be faced with glitches, difficulties, complications, and snags in the room. Hallelujah. But somewhere I heard that a man named Martin Luther King said that we, uh, he said it to an overflowing crowd in Memphis, Tennessee. And he said it in his I Have a Dream speech. He said, we've all got some difficulties days ahead. He said, but it really doesn't matter with me now. Because he said, I've seen the mountaintop. And I've seen the promised land. He said, and I may not get there with you, but I want you to know that we as a people, we will get to the promised land. And so I just dropped by to let somebody know today at Grant Hill, though the road may be rough, and though the way may be tough, and though the hill sometimes may seem hard to climb, some days your good days are going to outweigh your bad days, but some days your bad days may outweigh your good days, but I still need you to understand that God is the I am, and God will see you through, and that no matter what this is, a winning season. Huh? The second half of the message said, get in position. Listen, any winner understands that there is a position that you have to take in order to be a winner. 
A winner does not just happen by happenstance. A winner has to train. A winner has to prepare. A winner has to be in position to win or they can expect not to win. Huh? A winner can expect not to win. But although, like I said, the hills may seem hard to climb, I need you to be reminded that you can always look to the hills to which what your help comes from. And that God has not forgotten you. Somewhere in Psalms 37, I need you to understand that, I'm sorry, Psalms 23, that uh, somewhere the Lord says that he is your shepherd and that you shall not lack anything. Hallelujah, the Lord was already the children of Israel's shepherd. They lacked nothing, although they found a reason to complain about everything. Huh? Somewhere down in verse 3, he says, He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. God had already charted out the path to the promised land. All the children of Israel had to do was walk where God told them to walk and to keep a yes in their spirit, no matter what the glitches were, no matter what the snags were, no matter what the things were that came up against them that they felt like they could not face, all they had to do was keep a yes in their spirit because the uh, God of their salvation already had all the answers. Sometimes we don't realize that we don't have to complain all we have to do is go and ask God because he already has the answer. We don't need to complain about it. If we ask him, the Bible tells us to come boldly before his throne. Huh? If we come boldly, God will see to our needs. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. It does not matter what situation we're going through. God has promised to always be there and see us through. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible reminds us that even though I walk through the dark valleys, he says, I will fear no evil. The Bible says, for his rod and his staff, they will always comfort me. They will always comfort me. The staff will always comfort us. Honey, I just need you to touch three people and tell them that the staff still has power. Come on, anybody believe it? The staff still has power. Touch three people and tell them the staff still has power. The problem is we don't realize we got a staff in our hand just like the children of Israel did. The Bible told Moses to stretch forth the staff. The first thing he told him was stretch forth the staff. What God needed to do was sometimes God has to prove to us what he can do and how he's going to walk us through what he's going to walk us through. The first time you hear the mention of the staff, I believe it was somewhere over in Exodus 3 or 4 maybe, when God told Moses to stretch forth the staff. And he turned it into a snake. And then he turned it back into a staff. God needed Moses to see the power in the inanimate object that he was going to use to take them and lead them from the place of captivity to their place of freedom. My God, sometimes I don't think we realize we got a staff in our hand. Hmm. Tell somebody, the staff is proven. God took the staff then, and as he walked them around the easy way, he walked them around the easy way to take them to a place that he had to use what was proven to prove to them again that he was a God that could deliver them through any situation. I imagine the children of Israel as they got to the body of water and they looked behind them and the Egyptians 
Christians were charging them and they didn't know where they were going to go and they didn't know how they were going to move forward. The man of God, tell somebody we got a man of God. Hallelujah. We got a man of God. The man of God heard the word from heaven and he told the man of God, stretch forth your staff. Huh? There is a command and then there is an obey to the command. You have a staff, but you have to listen to the command and you have to obey. He told Moses, stretch forth your staff. And the waters, they did what? They parted. Hallelujah. And they parted just long enough for the children of Israel to make their way through. And as they turned and they looked backwards, the Bible had never said that Moses took his staff down. But as they looked behind them, the waters began to close in. Hallelujah. How many of you know that God will open a path for you to walk through? And when your enemies try to follow you, you swallow them up. The staff is proven. Hallelujah. And the staff still works. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Tell somebody, it's our winning season. Hallelujah. Get in position. What I need you to understand is, I told you earlier, that they had been complaining because God had fed them. Because they were complaining that they were hungry and now they wanted water. And so God had already shown them the power of the staff how many times already? At least two, huh? So God needed to prove himself to them uh, uh, that they, again, that the staff worked. But their contentious spirit brought in a battle that they might not have had to fight. And so as Moses obeyed and followed the voice of God to take the staff in a place that he, they were putting him in. Understand that. Because if we're willing to wait on what God has required, many times people in our lives won't have to go to a place with us because we waited on God. If they weren't complaining about the fact that they didn't have water, maybe they would not have been in that particular place where the Amalekites could have come upon them. But yet, God created an opportunity for a win, even in this position. And so Moses stretched forth the staff again for water. But even with that, he realized that the enemies were going to now start to come upon him. In his wisdom, he understood that he needed someone else to physically fight the battle. Listen, I don't pretend to be a theologian, but I believe that Moses was too old to physically fight the battle. So the Spirit of the Lord told him to get somebody who was physically able to fight the battle. But he never told Moses to give them the staff. Because even though Moses wasn't able to physically fight the battle, Moses had the commandment of the staff, and the staff still worked in Moses' hand. Don't give your staff to nobody else. Because your staff is not going to work in their hands the way that it works in yours. Huh? You can't walk in somebody else's anointing because it ain't for you. You got to use your staff for your stuff and let them use their staff for their stuff. Come on, somebody. But Moses understood that the staff was proven and that the staff still worked. And so what Moses did was he told a Joshua to gather some men from the camp. Huh? And I'm sorry, Joshua. 
Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought I said Joshua. She says that I was like, oh, wait, I didn't say Joshua. Joshua to grab some men from the camp and sent them out to fight. But Moses understood that the commandment to him was going to be to hold the staff up. Somebody know what this looks like? Huh? It looks like a yes. Huh? It looks like a yes. I need you to understand something. Uh, I, I want to share this real quick. The song that they sung, yes. Last week, God spoke in my spirit. I had asked someone to dance to that song. And then I learned that the choir, the, the praise team was singing it. And I was like, they're not singing that song. They never sang that before. But come to find out, the same song God had asked me to ask somebody to dance to, they were already preparing to sing it, even though they had never sang it before. I need to show you how intentional God is in everything that he does, and God is never not with us. God told Moses to raise the staff because he understood that the position of yes is not only represented in a why, but it is also in a position of I surrender. I surrender all to you. And it's not until we surrender unto God that we can say that we are in our winning season. December 27. 1992, at a little white church down on a street called Middle Street, I decided that I wanted to give my life to God. Sundays after Sunday, when the minister would call, I would say, I'm going to do it today. And I would let the altar call pass me by. And I'd go during the week. And I, 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 I decide that next Sunday is going to be the Sunday that I'm going to do it. And I went through this, I can't even tell you how many times. But December 27, 1992. Glory to God. The message preached by the man of God was, I surrender. And so today, I am encouraging you to take your staff in your hand and tell God, I surrender. I surrender. But here is where I need you to understand why I say get in position. Moses did not go to the top of the mountain by himself. Moses took two other men with him because although he understood that he had the power and the, 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 the position of the winning season in his life, that sometimes even in our winning season, we going to get tired. Y'all, but I got a little bit of arthritis and a little bit of bursitis in my arms, and it does not matter how much I want to praise God. Sometimes when they say lift your hands, my hands can't stay up, but so long because that thing in my arm starts to act up, and I gotta bring them down and regroup and go up again. The problem was every time he would let the
but my God. And we have 
have to be reminded no matter what we go through, the staff was proven in the Old Testament. And my God, I guarantee you, the staff was proven in my life, and if you allow it to be, the staff shall be proven in your life. Touch somebody and tell them, it's our winning season. Hallelujah. And I don't want you to tell them to get in 